Hello viewers, welcome to Catholicism and You, a program which focuses on questions bordering the minds of our viewers on Catholic beliefs and practices. I am Reverend Father Panaki Ubede, still Lumen Christi Television Network. On today's episode, the first question is asked, I have read that we have taken the sacrifice out of the mass. Is this true? Does the sac does the Eucharistic prayer no longer be referred to as the sacrifice? The present missal, that's the book containing the prayers, seeks to combine the notion of the meal and the Eucharistic action and the sacrament with what was predominantly emphasized in the previous Misa. Let me explain something to you from the scripture. You see, at the point of the Last Supper, he said, when supper was ended, Jesus took the bread. It gives us the idea as if to say there was a supper before now the sacrifice. The fact that the former offertory prayers were severely reduced in numbers and the gestures almost eliminated may cause some viewers to think that the sacrificial aspect of the mass has been diminished. The fact that the priest normally faces us during the mass as a sacred ritual meal as opposed to the priest not facing us and watching or elevating may make us think that the mass today no longer has the sacrificial aspect of it but i would like to turn the table around and offer some observation that in fact the new missile the new liturgy places more emphasis on the sacrificial aspect of the mass at the words of the institution for instance than the former one let me explain in ancient time the missile for consecration will say this is my body for those of us who are a bit elderly enough to remember the latin you know we we'll begin to understand that the emphasis is just this is my body but in the new one the text has been expanded in all the Eucharistic prayer, after the Vatican II Council, you see there is an additional phrase there. This is my body, which will be given up for you. The scriptural source for both texts are the accounts of the Last Supper in the Gospel. For instance, the first source of the text, this is my body, is gotten from Matthew chapter 26 verse 26 and what we use today is gotten from Luke chapter 22 verse 19 this is my body given up for you the principal reason offered as to why the new Misa contains the added phrase given for you is that it emphasizes Christ sacrificial death and resurrection commemorated in the Eucharist for us. The declaration when we say this is my body may well carry this connotation but it is certainly not explanatory and explicit in itself. So the people that gave us that edicted and worked on the new missile taught it twice to emphasize the sacrificial aspect of the mass at the precise place where it was classically put in place that at the words over the bread so one can say that the new missa in fact does a better link to the sacrificial aspect as seen from the last supper as compared to the ancient one in this present Eucharistic prayer, there are several references to the offering of the Eucharistic sacrifice. For instance, we say, 
we offer you God of glory and majesty, this holy and perfect sacrifice, the bread of life and the cup of salvation. If you check in the fourth Eucharistic prayer, it also states, look upon this sacrifice which you have given to your church by your Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, gather all who share this one bread and this one cup into one body of Christ, a living sacrifice of praise. This example makes it particularly important because it reminds us that we ourselves are to become spiritual sacrifices in the sense that we offer ourselves in service to others. As St. Paul will write in Romans chapter 12 verse 1. Again, what we find here is an evidence that what we do at the liturgy should be reflected in the way we live our lives. What Christ did once for all was to offer himself as saving sacrifice for our salvation. What remains to be seen is how we in the fact, in the sac we sacrifice ourselves for the sake of others. One more comment about the structure of the Mass. This goes back to the rite of the preparation of the gifts. The first proposal for the new Mass removed all the prayers said over the bread and wine and the invitation, pray brethren, with the response, may the Lord accept our sacrifice. Now, one of the reasons given why this invitation and the response was put back into the missile remains part of the ma remains part of the mass precisely because some evaluated the new missile throughout that the sacrificial element had been enveloped too much. By reinserting the text that our sacrifice will be acceptable, may the Lord accept the sacrifice. It's a way that the critics of the new missile were to be quiet. In short, I would say that there is plenty evidence that reflects that our belief that the Mass is a sacrifice is more in our liturgy today as compared to before. But there is also evidence to refer that the nature of the Mass still retains that sacrament, the meal, and the table fellowship which other believers in communion, that is, in union with God and with each other in Christ, still hold on to. So the aspect of the sacrifice of the Mass is still retained and has not been removed. In fact, it is emphasized more now than before. A viewer is asking, what is the church's teaching on, in, on indulgences? According to Pope Paul VI, in 1968, when they were about to begin the Vatican II Council, he gave an instruction, he authorized that a handbook, a manual containing the laws should be produced. This book we call technically the Enchiridion of Indulgences. All general provisions, grants, ordinances, that means laws, consigning indulgences were to be included in this book of law. By placing this book of law, therefore, his action revoked anything that was not in this book. In other words, Paul the Sixth and the book of the law, the canon law, the catechism of the Catholic Church, 
the book that contains the doctrinal teachings of the church now defined indulgence as a remission before God of the temporal punishments due to sin whose guilt has already been forgiven which the faithful Christian who is duly disposed gains under certain prescribed condition through the church's action. What I'm saying is that in dungeons, every time we commit a sin, there is a punishment due to that sin. Every time we say, I am sorry for the sin, you see, we are forgiven the sin. It's like a person having an injury you go for the treatment the injury is healed but then there is a scar so indulgence is like that which helps us to remove the scars after the injury has been healed so it's a grace that the church exercises from time to time as the minister of redemption she dispenses and applies with authority the treasury of the satisfaction of Christ and the saints. An indulgence, therefore, can be partial or plenary, depending on how it removes either part or all the temporal punishments due to sin. Indulgences may be applied to the living or the dead. as prescribed in the book of the law. The power of the Pope to grant indulgences rests on the power of the keys. You remember in the scripture when Jesus would say to Peter and the apostles, you are Peter, upon this rock I will find my church. Whoever sin you forgive is forgiven. Whoever sin you retain is retained. The power given by Jesus to bind and loose is where we derive the power to grant an indulgence. In granting indulgences, therefore, the Pope draws on the treasury of the church the superabundant merits of Jesus and the merits of the communion of saints. In this book of law containing all the provisions for the indulgences and the grants are attached to particular pious works or prayers. General grants of partial indulgences are made. You can get a partial indulgence. 1. For those who raise up their minds to God with humble confidence in the performance of their duties and in bearing the trials of life and add some pious invocation when I choose to suffer some restraints I suffer some trials when I say certain prayers I take up some, some, some acts of charity and indulgence can be granted two to the faithful who gives of themselves their goods in spirit of faith and mercy to serve their brothers and their sisters in need. When I choose to give a certain portion of my property for the poor or for the good of others, like as we see in those days, a king can come and say, for the good of the community, I will give half of my kingdom. We normally say, I will give half of my land so that they can use it to build charity homes. In return for that charitable work, one can incur an indulgence. There are spiritual benefits to charity. Three, to the faithful who in spirits of penance, voluntarily deprive themselves of the least seat and that which is pleasing to them. When I choose on my own, for instance, to do some acts of penance, some acts that purges away my sin. Some acts that kind of 
a kind of remission to particular prayers and acts such as reading the scriptures adoration of the blessed sacrament prayer before the crucifix these are some acts of penance i can do spend some time with jesus in the blessed sacrament indulgences therefore are obtained under the norms before the pope pius the sixth no sorry pope paul the sixth new norms remain valid but now you can obtain the indulgences only under the new norms we shall quickly go for a short break and when we return we shall be treating another interesting topic do not go away by the truth about god who created and redeemed us by the truth about a human person made in the image and likeness of God, destined for a glorious fulfillment in the kingdom to come. Always be convincing witnesses to the truth. Stir into the flame the gift of God that has been bestowed upon you in baptism. Light your nation, light the world with the power of that flame. Amen. Catholicism and you on Lumen Christi Network Station. Another viewer is asking what is meant by Luke, Luke chapter 10 verse 16 when Jesus says, whoever listens to you listens to me. According to a commentary written by Father Eugene, he writes that Luke's define definitely wants the reader to see beyond the 70 disciples immediately sent forth by Jesus. There are links with the future according to what he has written. They are to continue the teaching tasks of Jesus. Who are those who will come after the 72 elders and leaders of the church? As Luke will write in the Acts of the Apostle, in a sense, the teaching of Jesus and the mission of proclaiming the good news is given over the whole church. Everyone who is disciple of Jesus it is a tax and the office of the Pope and Bishop. When believers of the church and teachings of Jesus is in question, to formulate and express and proclaim authoritatively the teaching of the church. It means therefore that the Pope owes it as a duty and the leaders of the church. Any time that there is a confusion or a teaching is not clear, they are to do their research, do their finding, and give us a definitive pronouncement. They do not do that in vacuum. It must be done born out of consultation, consulting the tradition of the church. They consider the people's and the experts' opinion. They have to understand the teaching of Jesus on that particular issue. And they have to investigate through the theologians those who study God and the Word of God. In some cases, those in authority and leadership may first have to sift out what has been accepted as a matter of discipline 
in the tradition of the church. For instance, the practice of women wearing hats. From what has been accepted from the dogma or the institution of Jesus in the church. Jesus can use individuals to act in a prophetic way. He can even today make specific individuals his instrument to convey his message. This seems to be the case, for instance, with the three children of Fatima, Margaret, Mary, and others. In these cases, there is really not, not, nothing new about their teaching. Here, I'm trying to make a distinction between a private revelation. Since our eye, our knowledge is gotten from revelation, there is the public revelation and there is private revelation. We have gotten the fullness of the public revelation. Every private revelation is done so that to make the public revelation explicit, to make it clear. So it's like explaining a certain aspect to become more understandable. The private revelation is not supposed to be something different completely. No. Like St. Paul would say, even if an angel come or anybody should preach a different gospel from that which we have given to you, run away from such. So we are not propounding new doctrines, new revelations, but understanding a new insight. So development can be a new insight into that which we already know. In pronouncing, therefore, that the revelation given these people are worthy of belief, the church authority considers whether or not what the person claiming, the person claiming the revelation says, is in harmony with the public revelation given to God's people by Jesus and his disciples. In the end, the faithful are free to give belief to the claim, private revelation to the extent we believe that God has been active in giving the revelation. Every private revelation, therefore, that must be approved by the church and must be stamped as an official teaching must be in line with the public revelation. According to the Vatican II Council, it recognized that other churches, though not possessing the complete message of Jesus or all the means of salvation, can be instruments of God's grace and can communicate the word of God given to Jesus' followers. The individual person or minister will be speaking for Jesus to the extent that what he is preached conform to what Jesus taught and handed over to the apostles and disciples and the tradition of the church. In essence, once I claim to have a revelation and I say I want it to be defined as a dogma, it must be explaining that which Jesus had already put in place. It must not be something different completely. That's all what we are saying on this. An individual is asking, why doesn't the Pope define his own moral theological position as infallible? That means you are raising the question of infallibility. Can the Pope make, mis can the Pope make mistake? Can the Pope make error? The authority of the Pope and the Bishop is what we call the ordinary teaching. And the saints are complete. To understand some of these things and how it works can be complex. It boils down to the simplest term. The ultimate teaching authority resides in the Pope and the Bishop. It means therefore that in the church, a competent authority will be the Pope and the Bishop. Their gifts and their authority are to be respected according to what the code of the canon law the book containing the law 752 and 753 puts it 
in the face of challenge, when we encounter difficulties about their teaching, and in the face of the difficulties that exist in the midst of the people, the teaching authority of the Pope and the Bishop must be given a first hand. They must give credence and acceptance unless a particular theologian or an individual has compelling reasons for example facts arguments experience not considered by the teaching authority for dissent for instance before the pope is expected to make pronouncements we expect that experts theologians the scripture the tradition, history, all of them is looked at holistically to help in this decision. So in a case where an individual discovers that a particular ideology or certain considerations were not put in place in reaching the decision, the person can also draw the attention of the competent authority. But this, however, must be strong reasons and very convincing. So it's not a matter of I have an idea or it's not a matter of this is what I believe. No, it must be convincing for one to say he wants to go against the authority. It is not justified opinion or preference. Again, the presumption of truth or correctness is on the side of of the legitimately constituted teaching authority of the church. If given a particular situation or we have a problem, it's only the competent authority's pronouncement that is upheld. When the teaching authority is convinced after proper prayer, study, consultation and dialogue that is arrived at the truth, it has the responsibility when you consider this dialogue you consider the truth you consider scripture you consider history you consider the consultation you consider the expert and you have believed that what you have arrived at is convincingly the truth it's now the duty of the competent authority to speak and to give guidance to the people of god it may not uh, how will I put it now? It may not shake that responsibility. It is the teaching, authority's duty before God, and the Pope and the Bishop owe it to the faithful to give the dogmatic and the proper moral guidance. The people need such guidance, and many will welcome it. When the authority believes that the faithful are being harmed or confused by certain voices, certain opposed, opposing voices, it has the right to insist on its teaching and that those opposing voices be cautioned from instructing con something contrary to the people. It means therefore that the, the bishop can say that in his diocese, he doesn't want people to listen to certain people and certain doctrines. It may be that the person talking or opposing the belief in conscience and the teaching authority has not correctly discerned that which it has put. Let me explain it like this. If, for instance, a bishop in error makes a certain pronouncement and haven't looked at it, you discover that certain things in these teachings are not right. You you have uh, you are bound by conscience to object to say, I I think there are errors in this aspect. I think you do not consider this and this and this in doing it. Now, in putting up your arguments and the scientific research, and using your own human experience in showing this, the person who is bringing the opposition or that is drawing the attention of the bishop to those mistakes must do it with prudence and must present this 
in the academic parlance so that the congregation of the Pope and the bishop may consider such cases. Such person must not do it out of pride. They wouldn't do it out of ego. Like the Archbishop Daniel of Cincinnati once said in a pastor or once wrote in a pastoral letter that if I choose to go against an authority publicly, I must consider the fact that I am doing it at my own risk and I must be accepting the consequences. So it's always advised that we do it in private and we try to do it as humble as we can. Truth is not infallible. They send by wings. The teaching authority has the obligation of using every means of arriving at and finding the truth and being able to say yes this is in keeping with a constant acceptable belief of God's church and people when you have explored all the means of arriving at knowledge and from the depth of your heart that which you have arrived at is considered a known truth only then can it be proclaimed that something is infallible teaching an understanding of god's church in other words the pope the councils do not make something true by just declaring it they proclaim a better or a fact they proclaim a belief or a fact they have ascertained to be the faith of the church and infallibly true. My dear friends, we shall draw the curtain on today's episode at this point. I believe you had a wonderful time. Stay, do always stay with us. If there are questions, clarifications you need to make, kindly send your comments or suggestions to the numbers on the screen. Or you can send your emails to the address on the screen. I still remain Reverend Father Panaki Obede. God bless you.